Welcome to the show. It's me, John Park, and we are here for John Park's workshop. We're here in the workshop, uh, and we got some fun stuff to do today. I've got some things to show, some show and tell types of stuff. Oh, I got an extra window there. Uh, I've got a project, uh, ongoing project that we're going to be taking a look at the progress on. Uh, what else is happening? We've got a Circuit Python Parsec for you, a recap of a product pick of the week, and more. So. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone for stopping by. And if you're wondering where the chat is, there it is. That's what it looks like. Uh, and that is our chat over on Discord. So if you're somewhere else and you're wondering where's the chat, then you can check out our Discord. It's at adafru.it slash Discord. Uh, once you get there, this is the live broadcast chat channel. You can see on the sidebar there, we have a whole bunch of different channels. Uh, a lot of them are for help with different types of uh, projects and code and things like that. Uh, but this is where the, the chat happens during the show. We also have a chat over on YouTube. So hello, everyone who stopped by over there. Nice to see you all. Uh, so let's see. Let's, let's get going with stuff. Um, switch cameras here. There we go. Uh, first of all, I'll mention our job board. If you head over to jobs.adafruit.com, uh, we've got a job board right there. And... On it, not only we have job openings, but we also have a place for you to list your resume if you're looking for work. Uh, I just took a look at this earlier today, and check this out. We've got all sorts of people who are interested in getting work, and that might be contract or full-time, uh, in-person, remote, freelance, uh, who knows. But they're there, and uh, we, have, we have people such as embedded development experience, embedded developer in consumer products, toys, musical instruments, medical devices, and more. Wow. Sounds great. That's someone in Los Angeles, actually. Uh, retired Apple engineer who's looking to do some, some side gig work. So, uh, and on and on. Technical services, 3D CAD, engineering, embedded development, education and teaching. Uh, these are all people who are looking to, to do some work. And you can put your resume up there as well. It doesn't cost anything. All you need is a login, an Adafruit uh, login with your email address. And we promise to never spam you or sell your information or any of that stuff. So it's a safe, uh, safe place to, um, to post. So that's at jobs.adafruit.com. Go check that out. Let's see. Next up, I'll mention that right there. That is my uh, product show that happens on Tuesdays. A lot of you probably know about that. That's right at this time. In fact, it's at one o'clock Pacific time, four o'clock Eastern time on Tuesdays. And during the show, I pick a product. Sometimes it's new, sometimes it's old, something from our archives, but it's something that we sell. Uh, and it's something that we sell for a great discount during the show. So I'll put it through its paces, show you some project ideas with it, take a look at code, uh, and then you get to buy it up to anywhere from four to 10 of them. We usually put a, a restriction so you don't just get tons and tons of them. Uh, this week, I think it was a, a limit of four. 
a weird way to do four. Uh, but you got it for half price. And what I'm talking about is this right here. It's that Halloween M0. So this was a, uh, a popular one, I think, because Halloween is on the way. But it's also because it's a cool board. So uh, let me give you a little recap of the show. It is the Halloween M0. Spooky eyeball. One of the most versatile boards you can get, even though it is super specifically a Halloween style board. And then uh, go to the bootloader and you can drag and drop one of these UF2s. So let's try uh, this Dragon Eye. So I'm just gonna click on that UF2 to download it. Uh, and then I'm just dragging and dropping it again. Sorry, you won't, you won't see this because uh, I don't have my screen shared for that, but I'm just dragging spooky eye dragon.uf2. Uh, it's uploading it right now and then it restarted. So now you can see we've got this nice spooky dragon eye. I can cover the light sensor to adjust the slitty pupil uh, dilation there. So that is my product pick of the week this week. It is the Halloween M0. Spooky. There we go, yes, yeah, so that was yesterday. Uh, no, that was Tuesday. Yesterday was Wednesday, this is Thursday. Uh, glad I straightened that out. And I'll be back next Tuesday with another one, so come on by. Uh, let's see, next up, let's, uh, let's take a look at a hot tip in the circuit Python Parsec. All right, just finding all my windows there. Uh, so this is a, a uh, simple one, but a really powerful one, and this is a file that exists on pretty much any device that you're running CircuitPython on, and it is called bootout.txt. So let's take a look at what this is and why it's useful. So I've got Circuit Playground Express plugged in here. It's running CircuitPython. Uh, I'm going to hit open and head to the CircuitPy drive, and I'm, instead of opening code.py, which we usually do, I'm opening bootout under, uh, boot underscore out dot text, boot out dot text. There we go, I've got it open now. You can see the file name at the top there in the tab. Uh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and toggle soft wrap in my window here so we can see it all without it flying off the edge. Uh, so the boot out tells you these important things. Uh, what version of CircuitPython we're running on here. So we can see this says I'm running Adafruit CircuitPython 7.3.3. And that was uh, from the 29th of August, 2022. Uh, and then it lets me know the board I'm on. So I've got an Adafruit Circuit Playground Express with a SAM D21G18 uh, and the board ID, which is Circuit Playground underscore Express. So this is great because sometimes you may wonder what version am I running here? This is where you can find out. Now, not only can you do this, but that is what tools such as, let me uh, clean up my window here, such as Disco Tool use to give us this in information at the top here. So this says, hey, I'm, this, I'm connecting to Circuit Playground Express. Uh, and that's where it got that name from. So uh, if you're running a terminal, terminal program such as Disco Tool or TIO or other uh, REPL types of tools, this is how they find out, well, what's the version we're running? Uh, same with when we want to update libraries. If you're running something like CircUp, it can look at the board and say, oh, I see what version of CircuitPython we're running, so let's get the proper libraries. Uh, so that is what that friendly little file is for. And so that is how you can use bootout.txt on your CircuitPython hardware to figure out what version of CircuitPython you're running and more. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Uh, how about that, huh? It's a, it's a really useful one, I think. Um, in the in the chat, we've got a comment from DJ Devin says, I love bootout.txt, amazing when you have multiple boards running on different versions for different projects. Yeah, so um, if I take, for example, so, so right now I've got uh, that CircuitPython, uh, sorry, Circuit Playground Express drive there. If we, I'm just gonna go ahead first and plug in a board. I don't know what's on this board. It might not even have Circuit 
Python. It could be that it has Arduino. Let's find out. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just close that bootout.txt, uh, go open. OK, it is. I see a CircuitPy drive. Open up. Uh, says, OK, we're running the, let me go back to software app. Uh, this is running 7.2.4, and it's a Raspberry Pi Pico RP2040, and then it has that board ID uh, on there. So um, if you now plug in a, a second device, so I've now got two of these plugged in. Uh, so now I have a QD Pi here. Uh, let's find out if I get lucky and if that one's also running. Uh, it looks like it is. Okay, so this was... Uh, running 7.0.0 alpha 6, and uh, that is a Cutie Pie M0 Hack Express with the SAMD 21E18. You'll notice uh, since this is an older version, the bootout.txt did not include the name of the board. It doesn't have a nice name there, uh, which actually I'm kind of curious if I re uh, run Disco Tool now on the cutie pie. Oh, let's see, it knew the name. All right. Oh, and it's just saying its name. Is that what the code is doing? <laughs> the code is just saying its name over and over again. We're very proud of you, cutie pie. That's very nice. Um, okay, so I think it must have the name, but it's not coming from bootout.txt. Uh, not sure what the deal is with that, so I'll find out. We'll, we'll uh, explore that further another time. Unless someone here uh, in the chat has an idea of, uh, of the name and where that came from. All right, so let me put that out there. Uh, and I think this is probably when you hit um, control C to, to stop the code running, stop the code running and you're looking at the REPL. I think that's where it gets this info from as well. So you'll see it, it kind of gives you a prompt that says, hey, here's what's, uh, here's what's the board that you're currently dealing with, so you know, which is a nice hint before you go adding libraries from the wrong version and so on. Uh, and thank you to Todd Kurt for that tip. Todd Bot uh, said, hey, what about boot, bootout.txt? People probably wonder, what's the deal with bootout.txt? Uh, not to be confused with boot.txt, which you can use for advanced things we've covered before, such as um, enabling and disabling different USB things, USB HID, USB MIDI, and so on, uh, preventing the drive from showing up if you don't want to show up as a mass storage device. Those are things that are handled in boot.txt. Text. This is boot out dot text. All right. Uh, so let's see. Next up, I'm gonna uh, do a little bit of show and tell. Some some uh, cool items came in the mail just over the last couple days. It was a big uh, big day for things I had ordered a long time ago and almost forgotten about uh, to show up. So. The first one I'm going to grab is this right here, which is the replacement board for my Casio, uh, what is it, F91W. So this is the sort of classic Casio. Uh, let me go to the, the overhead. And it's a great watch. It does very little. It can do a stopwatch, the clock, and an alarm, and the date, and that's about it. Um, and drop down to this view here. Uh, Joey Castillo of Oddly Specific Objects worked on designing this sensor watch, which is a replacement motherboard. You can see I didn't even open it yet. This is a replacement motherboard that runs CircuitPython that fits exactly inside of this watch. We will probably do a, a I'll, I'll put this in here and then we'll take a look at it in action another time. Uh, but this is a real incredible feat of engineering. A lot of time and care went into um, low power consumption so that you get really long battery life out of it. It doesn't just gobble up the battery. Um, and it lets you do lots of other stuff. In fact, let's, uh, let me pop open a, uh, I'm gonna pop open a browser window. One second. And Let's go take a look at this. Oddly specific objects, sensor watch. This was a uh, crowd supply funding uh, 
th that effort that just came in. Uh, that's where I got mine. All right, so let me do a screen capture, new screen capture. Uh, oh, David Glaude says it's not running CircuitPython as far as he knows. Okay. For some reason I thought it. Give me a second here while we pull ourselves into a black hole and I bring up a new Chrome window. Google Chrome, sensor watch, here we go. Sorry I didn't prepare that uh, in advance. There we go. Uh, so that is the uh, crowd supply for it. It's an it's ARM Cortex-M0. Uh, and what can it do? So the clock face allows it to function like a watch. World clock allows you to display the time in any number of time zones around the world. That's not something the original can do. Beat time. Uh, Everyone's favorite weird swatch watch company effort from, I don't know, back in 1989 or something. They tried to change the way the entire planet uh, thinks about time, and they divided the day into a thousand beats. Uh, there's a one time uh, or a two factor authentication face for it, temperature, temperature log. Uh, there's a day one face that lets you count the days from your birth, so it's sort of like a, a, a count up. Uh, and on and on and on. This is a um, complete replacement for the motherboard. You're still using the same display. Uh, so he's using all of the LCD elements that are in there, just using them creatively. Uh, so it's not any new display stuff. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to see if it mentions anything about code on here. I'm sure David's right. Uh, so I don't know about, uh, I'm sure it's open source and you can go in and uh, mess around with the code if you want. Here's the, the GitHub repository, uh, library documentation, interface guideline, a forum, and so on. Uh, so these have, I think this was kind of like the first big batch of them to come in. Uh, I think there were some early bird people who got the blue motherboard or the blue PCB version. Um, but this is, uh, this is the sort of general release. Uh, I also got this thing, which is a little, um, pop in a down shooter view for a second here. Uh, this is a little flex connector um, that makes it easier to do um, swapping out for different sensor boards if you want to with, with uh, less, less soldering, less permanence. Uh, and what else? Yeah, so, so yeah, so this is using a uh, ARM tool chain. Yeah, I was totally wrong. It's not running circuit Python. Why did I think that? Maybe there was a different, different thing I was thinking of. Uh, so anyway, that is exciting. So that's my first piece of show and tell. Um, and I'm looking forward to putting that together once I get that up and running. Presuming everything goes well, I'll, I'll show that off maybe next week. Um, and then we have a second exciting show and tell. You've probably been seeing these around social media. Uh, this just came in. And this is a cross-section of a PCB here. Uh, this is the uh, No Starch Press Open Circuits book, which is gorgeous hardcover, uh, coffee table appropriate style book. Uh, one second, there we go. Uh, which was created by uh, Eric Schlapfer and Wendell Oske, who you may, you may I knew, uh, I've known Wendell for a long time from Evil Mad Science Laboratories. Uh, Eric goes by Tube Time online. And this is a gorgeous full color hardcover of cutaways and descriptions of the innards of all kinds of tiny electronic components. Here's, for example, a quartz crystal. Uh, it has a nice explanation of how it works. Here's a typical carbon film resistor. So if you've ever wondered what's inside of these, well, they've, they've got us covered. Um, beautiful cross sections, explanations of all the different types of capacitors here. Um, inductors, transformers. So you can see here's all the wire wrap that's been uh, coiled around and sliced neatly in half. Here's a diode. Uh, here's the at Mega 328, your favorite, and my microcontroller, uh, microcontroller chip from the uh, Arduino, one of the early Arduinos. And it uh, goes into some different LED types. 
some mechanical stuff with different uh, push buttons and switches, uh, dip switches. Look at this beautiful cutaway they did just of the, the very edge of this uh, little dip, multi-position dip switch. Tactile switches and on and on. I think, that, I can't remember if they've got it in here. They, they mentioned in at one point that they were working on a uh, cross-section of a mechanical key switch for a keyboard, uh, but that the photo might not have made it in. So, uh, ever wonder what's on the inside of a quarter-inch phono plug or a TRS plug? There it is. Uh, so, check this out. It is gorgeous. Um, it's, I think, generally available. Uh, probably can just go to No Starch Press, um, maybe Amazon and other places. Hopefully, uh, you've got a local bookstore you could go ask for them to, to get that in. So, uh, great job with that. Um, beautiful photography uh, open circuits. So, that's my other show and tell for today. Um, <laughs> let me bring up the chat just so you can groan with me at that uh, comment. Wow, there really are more than meets the eye in those transformers. Terrible. Uh, all right, so uh, one other thing I want to do is just do a quick uh, overview of my newest guide that came out, and this is for, I can find my tab there, uh, this is for the Darth Faders project, so uh, there's the, the Darth Faders guide, let me get that back on fully on screen there, there we go. Uh, and I've got a little demo movie, a little demo GIF there, so you can see it in action. Sorry, my mic was acting funny. Uh, and the guide is broken up into a few sections. So first we have uh, building the circuit. So I've got some fritzing diagrams there. Um, I like to do this, by the way, with, with fritzing diagrams for stuff that's stacked. Uh, since we have a feather with some connections going to it, and we also have that feather wing, that motor feather wing, excuse me, I went ahead and uh, pulled those away from each other, and then I have a second uh, image of them stacked on top of each other here. So this is, this is them stacked, just so you're clear on uh, what's plugged into what, because a lot of times our feathers, uh, rather our feather wings don't have silk screen on them for the pins, because they can go on top of different feathers, which may have uh, some different pins on them. Uh, so that way you can refer to that when you're building it. Um, and then I do the build of the flying faders with uh, those fancy connections like I've said before. You can use wire, uh, strip them, solder on one end, screw it into the terminal blocks on the other end. Uh, I decided to make the uh, interconnects a little easier to deal with when you're putting this together. Uh, and so I've got the DuPont connector fancy. Um, what do we call them, deluxe silicone covered jumper wires. And uh, it's a sacrifice because they're not cheap. They're not as cheap as wire, but for certain projects, it's really a nice luxury to be able to do that, uh, that interconnect. Even though it's not a locked interconnect or a, uh, a keyed one for polarity, it works pretty well in this case um, because of the color coding. And you can see there, I've, I've got the uh, terminal block with some little other ends basically of those same wires uh, of the, the socket ends of those cables. So those are screwed in nicely. It's stranded wire uh, and it, it goes, I think was, what are these, 22 gauge? Um, and it goes really nicely into those, those terminal blocks, but then we get that easy connection when we're putting it together later. Uh, prep the feather with the uh, stacking feather wing because it needs to go into the terminal block wing and then get the motor uh, on top of it. And same sort of thing, I've got, um, the little pigtails coming off of there on the motor feather wing. And uh, yeah, DJ Devin says it's really uh, nice to have fritzing to explain this amount of project wiring. If I just took a photo of that and said, there you go, then people would probably have questions <laughs> about my, why I'm so sadistic, first of all, and, and how it's actually supposed to be put together. So um, those, those are a reality check, the, the photo of it. But yeah, I think the, the fritzing diagram is, is a real huge help for explaining how these types of projects go together. Uh, so that's my typical process too, is to put it together uh, with no enclosure. Then we've got the enclosure here. This is just uh, some renders of the 
model files, uh, parts placement, and the, th the download of the STL files, uh, and then assembly. So we go through and uh, put it together, screw things in, add the encoder, add the DC jack on the back there, connect it all up, put the cap on top, screw it together, and then we're ready for code. Uh, shows you where the little on off switch is, and then uh, got a page on installing CircuitPython in case you don't have that, and then the actual uh, project download for the code. Uh, and if you're not familiar with these, by the way, when you, when you go to uh, an Adafruit guide, you will usually find that there's a download project bundle uh, icon with that little cloud picture next to it. If you click that, you'll get a zip file that will contain your uh, code as well as the library files you need for both CircuitPython 7 and CircuitPython 8. So we automatically put that together pretty soon after uh, the code is uh, put up on our GitHub. We have some process in the background that generates this nice little bundle that you get that's this compressed zip file. It contains everything you need. Also, if there are images and graphic, uh, uh, graphic images, audio, or other assets that you need for the project, uh, they all come in that nice little bundle. So I say that so that you don't go and just copy the code, even though we have this nice copy code thing. So you don't just copy the code, paste it into your um, editor, save it, and then go adding your libraries, you actually don't necessarily need to do that if you want to just grab that project bundle. Um, DJ Devin asks, did you ever print another base plate to fix the broken foot issue? Uh, so yeah, I printed a new base plate that had taller pegs to, to set down my uh, board on. And then the broken bit was, uh, sorry, I left, it, I left it inside my studio inside. The um, broken foot, I super glued it. I decided not to reprint that. It was a long print and I didn't need to, so I, I uh, used some uh, CA accelerator and CA glue and, uh, and that's good enough. So uh, I, I didn't feel the need to waste the plastic and the time. So. Uh, so yeah, so there's the code. And then I've got a code explainer. Uh, and that just kind of gives you a brief overview of the different sections of the code and what they do. So um, that should help people who have uh, cus uh, questions or if you want to customize things. Uh, the, big, the big customizer here is this, this little list of positions. That's the animation pattern or sequence or set of poses that we go through. Um, yeah, DJ Devin said, yeah, I've been guilty of doing that too. Um, guilty of the super glue or of the copy and code? Because super glue, I never was a big fan until I started using Accelerator. In fact, I have some right here. This is, some, this is still working even though it's kind of yellowed from, I think, the sun. The sun was hitting, <laughs> hitting this. Uh, but this works great. If you hit, hit one uh, side of the things you're joining with Accelerator and then just a tiny bit of the CA glue, super glue, put them together and it cures almost instantly, uh, which is important because you don't have any sort of work time to wiggle things around. You kind of got to get them right the first time. You have like a moment to pull it off, but really uh, it just um, is a catalyst that, that causes it to start uh, curing uh, really quickly. So uh, that changed my opinion of using super glue in general and on 3D prints in specific because it never worked well for me just trying to, trying to CA glue 3D prints. I, I often did friction welding uh, or used some specific PLA glue, uh, which works pretty well. But yeah, CA with accelerator is nice. Uh, so that is it. Yeah, that's the, the guide. Sorry, I forgot to, to bring it in here, but, it, but there is a, a little video there that you can watch now of, of it in action doing its uh, Darth vader -y thing. And uh, as I may have mentioned before, I didn't give this anything other than it's a sci-fi prop. I didn't have it do any functional things like sending out MIDI or sending out volume uh, HID messages, lighting control, but it would be cool for all of those things. So you could have these faders do, uh, do something, control something, and since you can pause it and then move them, uh, it really can be an interactive fader. We can also use, uh, I, I wired up the touch, capacitive touch uh, aspect, but didn't code it to do anything. Um, so if you want to, you can, uh, add the, the resistors necessary to use cap touch. Um, I just also noticed in the chat, let me bring up the chat because there's interesting discussions. Uh, someone said, I need to figure out how to use CircUp. 
Circup is amazing, uh, changes your life as far as installing libraries go. And yeah, Steve Grover said that the, the latest, uh, or, or at least a recent disco tool includes Circup in it. So you can do your library installs from inside disco tool. I should take another look at that. I've done it once, but I don't know if that's changed. Um, and I usually don't, I usually forget and just go to a different uh, terminal window. Um, all right, so let's uh, go on to our uh, project build and update section of the show here. I'm gonna get a sip of water. Uh, Randall Bond in the YouTube chat says, could you make Darth Vader track Venus or Jupiter? That'd be wild. Yeah, you could maybe turn that into some sort of a tracking device. Uh, just look which way it's pointing. Uh, yeah, DMX controllers too, for sure. Yeah, it could be a, since it's flying faders, it, it's great for, for that kind of stuff, for show control types of things. Uh, thanks, Christopher Netherton. Good, good idea. You know, I have uh, ditched the only DMX controlled lights I had. I, I, I gave one to Todd by. It was a big follow spot, DMX control follow spot. I had a couple of others. I got rid of them. He's trying to get rid of his now, but I don't want it. It's too huge. But I don't have anything to control via DMX. Um, but I, I kind of should get some some little mini spot or something like that and, and uh, have that for doing a DMX project sometime. All right. So project time. Uh, let's let's head over to the bench. I got a bunch of junk on there. I got to clean off. So let's let's head over there and then do some cleaning and uh, and camera setup uh, and. We're gonna let me shrink that camera view down a little bit. Uh, we're gonna look at continuing the split keyboard project. So, let me zoom out a little bit. Sorry, I've got a huge mess here. I had about four things going at once and I didn't get a chance to clean. Um, so you can see here, I've got some of my leftover keys from, uh, from the split key ortho I put together. And as a reminder, whoops, there we go. As a reminder, uh, this is the project sort of in its development stages. So I've got some wiring to, to redo. This one's kind of my, this, this board here is my um, experimentation one. So I soldered some headers onto it, make it easy to hook up, but I'm gonna use a different one for this. Uh, that'll be more like this, which is wired directly. Uh, to our little breakout, the TCA 8418. Uh, I made a mistake of not really thinking too hard about how I was wiring things before, uh, or rather how I was enclosing things before I wired them. And I want this to have, uh, I want it to be positioned here, but flipped the other way, I think. Um, so I may need to rewire some stuff because my wires are too short to flip it the other way. We, I don't know, I may, I may get away with that. Um, but what this is, uh, is the five by six or six by five ortho snap apart key matrix. Uh, keyboard diode matrix has NeoPixels in it. Uh, easy to use as direct GPIO or as a matrix. That's the better way to do it. Uh, and so I'm using this matrix keyboard driver uh, uh, expander called the TCA8418. This can do 10 by eight rows, I think, is that right? Uh, so not enough to do both of these. So I'm using two of them and going over two I squared C buses on a RP2040 Cutie Pie. Uh, so here's the second one. Again, this one is for experimentation. I'm not gonna have these big header pins on here in the final. Um, but this all works. This is working as a USB HID device, single USB plug on the uh, Cutie Pie there and it's, it's HID. I don't have layers on it. Uh, I haven't, haven't worked on the code since last time, so it's, it's just functioning with kind of what you see here, except not lower and raise. I'm not going to different uh, sets of functionality for those keys. Let's see, how's that focus? Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, so next step, and actually I'm gonna do a little cooking show rewind here real quick, which is I'm gonna open up the case that I'm working on so I can show you the parts and how it goes together. And that's a little more interesting, I think, than, than seeing it get taken apart uh, right now. 
more dramatic at least. So let me do a bunch of unscrewing. I won't unscrew all of it, but I'll show you in a second the, the drama builds. Uh, the way I'm putting this together, so I'm, I'm designing this in Rhino, um, but you could do this in any CAD package. And I've got some accurate measurements with calipers of my boards and where the holes are. Uh, I'm designing it so that it can be either a 3D printed or a combination of 3D printing and laser cutting, which I really like to do. Um, just because when you do flat plates, 3D printed, they take forever and they're never quite flat. You can see I got a little curl there. I mean, there are people who are better at 3D printing than I am, like the Ruiz brothers who can get flat out of that, but this has always seems silly to me to, to design a two-dimensional thing with some holes in it and not just laser cut it or drill out a piece of material that you've cut on the saw. So, um, so I'm doing it as a combo. I really like doing laser cut acrylic plates uh, or wood. So let me pull this apart. Okay, so let me show you my thought process here. Um, yeah, so first of all, actually, I'll, I'll show this one. So this is the base here. Uh, and you can see the holes I got here are for a, kind of three different things that I'm connecting. I have these outer holes, which are going to allow me to run screws into the walls, uh, which is sort of the height and thickness of this thing. Uh, and so this is the 3D printed part in, in my case. Uh, what I've done is just put some heat sink, uh, what do you call them, heat set threaded inserts, these little guys here. Uh, I can zoom in, focus that up. So use these little brass inserts, you can push them in with a special tool on the end of your soldering iron or just your soldering iron tip. Uh, and I've pushed one in from the top and another one in from the bottom here uh, so that I can screw into this without needing to run one big bolt all the way through and put a nut on the other end. Uh, instead, I can run a screw up from the bottom and a screw up from the top, which will keep my base and top affixed to this thing. Uh, so this is the walls. Now, this being 3D printed, we can do some cool stuff we can't do on 3D, or rather on the laser cutter, like have cutouts for USB and I2C STEM QT ports. So that's what those are there. Um, so that's the walls. This is, this is the 3D printed walls. Um, so that would sit on top of here. This is the 3D printed base, but this, I'm actually going to use my laser cut one, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then the other holes are for attaching the PCB. So I'll show you, this is coming out of the oven here. This is the one I've already, I don't feel like unscrewing all of this stuff. So here I've got uh, holes for the four uh, mounting holes of the NeoKey uh, PCB. And let me put one of those screws back in there. Uh, you can see I have not yet perfected how I'm attaching the cutie pie. I had an idea of uh, using, I'll just pop off, there we go, using some uh, pins that I'm not soldering to um, and connecting them through with some uh, header pins. So I can just set them on there and it kind of just spikes it on there, which is neat. And then I've just used header pin plastic on the other side and maybe even a little glue for that. Uh, I think I'm gonna try to do something a little better than that, maybe a little bracket, a little 3D printed bracket that I can screw, screw into a couple more holes there. Um, but so that gives me my cutie pie which will be connected to one uh, of the TCA8418s right here over Stemma QT. Uh, and then the other side, because remember there's gonna be two of these, the other side will have another Stemma QT cable coming in uh, and heading straight to the board. And I'll need a little breakout for a second Stemma QT there or, or uh, solder it directly to the board. So uh, that, you can see I've got some mounting holes and I did that symmetrically. I kind of did everything symmetrically, which not a bad idea when you're prototyping because sometimes you realize you've printed or you've laser cut the wrong side. And so if you can make it symmetrical, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so nice side. This has a, a, a matte finish side. I like that to be on the exterior. The smudgy fingerprint side is going to be kind of hidden on the inside. 
and then this has all the holes for the walls, as I showed. So that goes like this. Uh, and then we can just run either metal or nylon. I happen to have these nylon uh, M3 screws. And these are the M3 four millimeter long uh, heat set inserts. We also carry three millimeter long ones, just in case your project is so uh, tight that you need the shorter one and you need that extra millimeter. Um, I'm guessing the Ruiz brothers requested that and had some specific projects that used one and others that used the other. So, but this is nice. This, this actually, this little wall here, I'm gonna make this higher. Uh, I'm gonna make that a bit taller, which will give me more room for, oops, my mounting of the cutie pie. Uh, and it will reach up a little higher into the keyboard keycap area because I don't like the way um, it's currently floating above everything. So I won't screw all of those in, but that's, uh, oh, or did I? No, that's, that's a few, that's about half of them. Uh, but that gives us a nice secure connection having, having uh, six screws in there. Uh, that one didn't get screwed in enough. The port there, you can see we can plug into our I squared C and USB is in the wrong spot. So I need to change the way. I wasn't thinking about how I was mounting that. So the hole is a little too high or it's too low if I flip it the other way. So I'll, I'll be working on that. Uh, the next thing is a key plate. So you can see here, I've just pushed a few keys through. Actually, I'm not using this 2U wide one here, but I've pushed a few keys through. Uh, these help stabilize because these are not soldered in. These are just press fit in. Uh, and this you need to do it carefully because you can bend those little feet. But if you've checked that they're not bent and get them all pressed into place, I may actually build a spacer for this because I'm currently having to fight the, the key plates instinct to pop up. So I may, I may give that a little uh, spacer. One other thing, by the way, as far as your mounting options go, is that you actually get a bazillion M3 I think they're M3 sized holes between each key. So if you want a smaller case and you want to hide some of your screws, you can use these uh, in between the corners. Every vertex is, is big enough for an M3. Uh, so let's see, I'll get that lifted up. These really are optional, but they do keep the keys from wobbling sideways. I, I recommend them uh, having a key spacer. And this again can be a 3D printed part. I've done that before. Uh, all right, I'm gonna leave that be. So then the last piece is the cover. So this just has the six holes uh, to screw in from the top, the M3 screws that mount it to those threaded inserts that are in the wall object. And boy, do I like this more than the usual. I, I often go for the easier, uh, run a big screw all the way through and put a nut on the bottom. But this is so much neater to have all um, fasteners headed inward. So uh, the only other thing about this is that I put a couple of access ports here and here for the boot and reset buttons of the Cutie Pie. It's not the prettiest thing in the world. Uh, I think I'm gonna experiment with flipping the cutie pie upside down so that those holes are on the bottom as well because I don't really like having those up there. Uh, but you do need either to run external buttons or give yourself some, some sort of access that you can then use a little tool uh, to poke, poke those buttons for doing reset or, or uh, bootloader modes. Um, so that, I just wanna look at it. One thing I haven't done yet is taking a look at this with the full key bed uh, in place, but it'll currently ride like that, which is pretty high, pretty proud of it. So I may make, that's what I'm saying, I may make the walls a bit bigger so that this uh, sits up kind of just at the, at the base of those keys there. Um, and then we'll have uh, some 
rubber bumpers on the bottom or I may do an option for a slight rake. It's nice to have these at like a, a little bit, maybe a five degree angle or something like that. Uh, could also do that with feet. We have some uh, M4 large aluminum feet that can screw onto the bottom of things. In fact, I've used them before. Did I steal them? I stole them off the bottom of this one. Oh no. I had, <laughs> I had run some M4 screws through this macro pad case I built and I apparently needed those and stole them, uh, probably for my joystick project. But uh, that, if you just put a couple of those at the back and, and some uh, rubber bumpers towards the front, you get a nice connection there. Uh, let me check the Discord chat, just because I've forgotten to check that, and who knows what could be going on over there. Um, could add a reset switch on the case and run it to the reset and ground, yeah. Um, could, could for sure just get a real button on there somewhere, it's a good point. Um, magnetic connector, people have been bringing that up too. Yeah, I like, I like the idea of that. Um, since we have some four pin magnetic connectors, we could do all of that I squared C cabling between the two like that. So I may experiment with that. I'll also leave like a dead simple version of this uh, available as well, just cause um, it's nice to have, have a simple version you can make where you can go full deluxe uh, version. But anyway, that's the progress on this. I will be uh, doing some more CAD. I, I also wanted to show you one thing that I did early on was um, print out. Boy, that's way, way blown out, but uh, show it to you like that. Uh, I did some printouts of my one-to-one -one scale line work just to check that holes aligned. Uh, something I didn't notice though was that I had been using an old uh, template of, shade this, you probably can't see this, this is a five by five grid by accident, which is what I used on one of my numpad projects. Um, this originally when I cut it was too narrow because I made it for a five by five. Luckily I was able to put it back on the laser cutter and use the uh, stock that was in there as a jig to, to be in the exact same place, changed my CAD drawing to widen it out and then recut and it just took off the, the excess so now it fits but before it was covering uh, covering the two side rows it was completely wrong. Uh, width of the PCB was right but I completely failed to notice that I was missing a bunch of keys. Um, all right so let's see I think that's all I wanted to show you about that. Um, this by the way there were some questions last night on show and tell about the key uh, cap set that I'm using. This is the dancer set from Drop in the MT3 profile. Uh, dancer is kind of a funny play on Dasher, which is the Dasher terminal from Data General that this colorway is based on, but it was inverted. It was mostly dark blue with just a few of the lighter uh, greenish blue. Uh, this is the inverted set. These are the extras that I haven't used. So everything here plus these was the, the set for the ortho. Um, set. And the thing about the ortho set is they're all 1U. Normally control and caps lock and keys like that are real wide uh, backspace. These are all 1U except for there's a couple of options for, uh, for wider space bars that I'm not using because I'm doing the split keyboard. Um, so that's the, that's the dancer set. Dasher is the opposite colorway. All right. So let's... Uh, Grab my phone here. And we can wrap it up. Let me know if you've got other questions over in the chats. Um, let's see. Yeah, magnetic connector. Thanks, Sunisku. Love that idea. Acrylic laser cutting makes more, far more sense in that scenario. Candidate for an instructable with someone, uh, Johnny Bergdahl made a moon lamp that tracks the phases of the moon. Very cool. I'm glad I kept the BS key to keep it real. <laughs> you could use delete, but it's, it's backspace, right? Uh, backspace and delete, we have both options. Uh, David G's making a joke, I think. Is that a Dell keyboard? Uh, DJ Devin said, someone suggested they would be great on the walk person. Uh, these keys, is that? Is that what you were referring to? These keycaps. 
I don't know. The elite key. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by. Uh, I'll be finishing the workup on this for code and uh, CAD files, three models, work on the guide, get that out to you, and then we'll be uh, getting some other fun projects going after that. Uh, I'll be back on Tuesday with another product pick of the week, and then on Thursday with John Park's workshop. And we've got a bunch of other live streams along the way, so please come on by. Uh, that's going to do it for another episode of John Park's Workshop on John Park for Aid Fruit Industries. See you next time.